Hello, and welcome to another edition of Active Living. We got our good friend Joe Johnson here today. Joe's been traveling around the country. He was recently in LA, and now he's uh, just come back from Las Vegas. So he's quite a traveling man. That's right. The, la the Las Vegas trip was actually planned before my LA trip. My family just needed to get away. They were starting to ease restrictions and stuff like right. that. And they said, look, we're gonna take care of all the arrangements. Do you wanna tag along? I said, yeah, sure. So um, tagged along, went out to Vegas. Now I'm not a gambler. I don't go out to Vegas hoping to win money. I plan on losing money. Right. Um, so I try to look for other things to entertain me while I'm out there. I do a little bit of gambling, but I prefer to visit museums, see shows, that sort of thing. Yeah, well gambling can uh, set you back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it can, and you have to you have to budget for that you, or it's you gonna do have ruin to budget. your trip. You do have to budget. I don't okay. wanna spend the week in my hotel room, you know, <laughs> watching cable, so. Well, when I go out there, like I say, I, you know, I, I normally have a budget. I, when I hit the budget, which is normally about one night, it's gone, then I, <laughs> then I stop gambling. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And you know, the casinos, you know, people like the strip, I'm not, huge on the strip but you have all these different casinos and as you go from casino to ca casino once you're inside they all kind of look the same they all have the same games and they look the same they sound the same yeah. you can hear them you know as soon as you walk in the door you know you're you're there and the funny thing is is if you try to walk the strip it's rigged to kind of make you pass through the casinos so I think they all, not that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but I think they all got together and said, we, we're not gonna let people walk around outside. You're gonna have to pass through our casinos and hopefully hit the slots. Do they still allow smoking out there? Uh, the there casinos? was some smoking, yeah. um, not as bad as I recall when I, you know, my younger days. Uh, but I will say this, that when it came to masks and vaccination cards and stuff, yeah. they were far more strict than we are here in really? Michigan. Wow. Everybody wore a mask in the casinos. Wow, that's great. Yeah, you got dirty looks if uh, you didn't have a mask okay. on. So, so yeah, I, I felt pretty comfortable going to Vegas. People say, oh, how can you go to Vegas this, this, with this yeah, thing right, happening? Right. I felt more comfortable in Vegas than I do here in really? uh, Michigan. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I got a quick story, though. My first time out there, I went into the casino with a bunch of guys, and it was a guy sitting, as we walked in, I think it was Caesars Palace or someplace like that, as we walked in the front door, there was a guy sitting there signing autographs. You know who it was? Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis. Joe Lewis. This, now this dates me a little bit. Wow! Did you get an autograph? No, I didn't. Oh, <laughs> wow! But yeah, that's that awesome. was kind of interesting. Yeah, you never know who you're going to run into. Yeah, right. Day. Yeah, I have a friend who uh, he did voices on the radio, and one of his better voices was Rodney Dangerfield, and he told me a story how he went to Vegas one time, and he got up from uh, you know the tables and went into the restroom and standing next to him at the urinal was Rodney Dangerfield. Oh, so right? he started doing his Rodney Dangerfield voice and Rodney Dangerfield was giving it back to him and so they had dueling Rodney Dangerfields at the urinal. So. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could have seen that. That's great. <laughs> well, how about these places that you visited? You said you're not really that interested in the gambling, but how about what kind of places did you, did you get to see out there? Well, first of all, uh, when we flew out there, we, uh, we stayed at a place called New York, New York. Um, it's a New York themed, obviously, hotel and casino. And um, one of the cool things about it is that there's an area within the casino that makes you feel like you're sitting on an old New York street, like in the Bronx or something. Really? And there's restaurants, there's delis, uh, little bars, uh, p you get pizza slices, bagels. Um, you can see a picture of it in the bottom left corner there. Um, it, f it feels like you're in New York really? with cobblestone oh. streets. And so when I wasn't out and about and tr gambling and losing my money, I loved just hanging out. They had dueling pianos and stuff. Oh, I so love that. that was really yeah. pretty neat. So New York, New York was kind of a cool place uh, to stay. So now, you know, we were talking earlier, people, when they go to Vegas, they love going to the Strip. And I didn't realize until just a few years ago that there's downtown Las Vegas, right. which people know as Fremont Street. Okay. I didn't know that still existed until a few years ago because Vegas has a tendency to tear down and rebuild. Right. So there's not a lot of history in Vegas anymore. But when you go to Fremont Street, even though there's some modern technology with the video screens 
going over Fremont right, Street. Right. A lot of those casinos have been there for decades, a yep. long time. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of, like the, the Cowboy, which is an iconic neon sign, is still there on, on Fremont Street. Are those, are those uh, videos that we see uh, in, uh, in the upper part of that? Uh, yeah, so there's a screen, uh, there's kind of a tent canopy over Fremont okay. Street. And they project, and project images and stuff on that. Wow, so that's interesting. it's always there's always something moving, animation, wow. something. There's people zip lining down Fremont Street. Right? I wasn't <laughs> bold enough to try that. Um, but when you go into some of these casinos, you feel like you're stepping back in time. You know, there's five dollar blackjack tables right. versus fifty dollar blackjack tables on the strip. Um, so there's an old school feel to Fremont Street. Right. And so I personally prefer walking Fremont Street than yeah. uh, than the strip. I was down there one time but it, but it was but it was uh, didn't it didn't have the canopy with all of the lights and stuff like yeah. that. But it was like you were walking uh, in the middle of the day and there was so many lights down there. You know, <laughs> right, exactly. At midnight it was still bright. <laughs> I think Elvis said it that uh, Las Vegas turns day into nighttime and night into daytime. There you, you know. go. Uh, one interesting thing about Fremont Street, uh, one of my hobbies, and we've talked about this when I was in uh, Los Angeles, I like tracking down filming locations. And um, if you've ever seen the movie Diamonds Are Forever, it was uh, Sean Connery's last James Bond film, uh, a lot of it is set in Vegas and okay. specifically on Fremont Street. And there's a pretty famous scene where he's, he's in a red uh, Mustang Mach 1, he's being chased by the Vegas police. And to escape the police, he goes into this alleyway, and then he hits this ramp, goes up on two wheels, yeah. and he goes down this narrow pedestrian right, walkway, that, right. when the cop pursuing him flips over <laughs> on his hood. And then he comes out the other end of the alley onto Fremont Street. Well, out of curiosity, I'm, knowing that Hollywood doesn't preserve its history, I'm like, I wonder if those locations are still there. And much to my surprise, the alleyway that the car enters is still there. Really? And I found it, and I took some pictures That's here. Great. And um, now, when the car actually hits the ramp and goes up on two wheels, that was filmed at Universal Studios lot there. Um, but going into the alley and coming out of the alley was filmed uh, at Fremont Street in Vegas. So That's it's kind of neat to see that right. some of that history is still there. Yeah. But it's changing rapidly. Things are getting torn down and things are getting built up. But I wonder yeah. how they survived though during the during, during COVID. They they must have had, you know, they got a ton of hotel rooms out there. Yeah. And I would think that they would have had a, a difficult time. Yeah, I would imagine. But, but they're they're doing fine now. Now it's, they're back uh, in the place. I mean, the crowds didn't seem as big as they were pre-COVID, but. Um, they still seem to be doing all right. right. So I think, you know, those precautions that they're taking really help. Now, speaking of history in Vegas, I, uh, last time I was out there, someone told me that there is a museum uh, called the, the Neon Museum, or some call it the Neon Boneyard. And what's happening is, is as these casinos are getting demolished, right. they're trying to salvage what they can of, of the history. So they're taking the signage from Stardust, the Sahara, the wow. Indians, Horseshoes, um, and they're they're on display at this <clears throat> this neon museum, this outdoor neon boneyard. So they're actually preserving them, keep them going, and exactly people can go yeah. out to see them. And they're not great. they're not restoring them; they're keeping them in their original condition. Right. Other than these lights, you can see the lights are still yeah. working wow. on a lot of these. Um, but I'm a history buff and. We got a guided tour through the, the boneyard there. And, and not only the, the, there's signage from the casinos, but there's signage from old businesses and things on display right, right. as well. And that was really neat to see. I bet it was. Yeah. I saw Stardust there and a couple other really yeah. interesting ones. Exactly. And the, the neon sign that you see there in the middle, that's you pass it as you enter. About a week or so later, I saw on social media that Mick Jagger was posing in front of that very sign like oh, really? a week later. He was doing the Rolling Stones tour, right. and he must have decided as he was going from city to city, he was going to go out like a tourist. So there was a, a picture of him posing in front of that, that sign, and then like a week later, he was posing in downtown Detroit at the Joe Louis Fist. Right, and, right. And so that. Mick yeah. Jagger's a tourist like the rest of us. Yeah, so. cool. <laughs> 
So I really recommend the Neon Museum if you get a chance. Well, to he makes more money than we do. That's true. That's true. <laughs> a little bit. Um, now, another passion of mine are uh, Hollywood cars, uh, cars from television and film. And I found out that um, near the Strip is a Hollywood Cars Museum. So I figured, oh, I'm going to go spend some time over there. So I went down there, and the outside of the complex, it's sort of a business industrial complex. It wasn't very impressive, and I was thinking, what did I get myself into? But I went in, paid my admission. It was a self-guided tour. And as I walked through this this area my jaw hung open really um some of these cars that you see here are replicas but most of them are actual screen use cars from television and film including starsky and hutch um james bond's underwater submarine knight rider dukes of hazard batmobile a team van and uh, Back to the Future, and, and the list goes on and on and on. Wow. And, uh, so how many cars did they have at this place? Uh, there had to have been at least 50, if not more, wow. uh, that were on display, and a huge collection of Liberace cars that he had owned that were all, they looked oh. like disco balls. They were <laughs> mirrored and shiny and gold, and there was oh, yeah, one shaped like a piano. And, Is that um, right? Yeah, so I guess they, they inherited this collection of Liberace-owned vehicles. Wow. Um, He was a little flamboyant, wasn't he? He was, he was. (laughs) Well, you know what I thought was interesting, and this made me feel a little old, is there was a sign with a QR code on it, and it said, use your phone to scan the QR code to find out who Liberace was. And I'm like, who doesn't know who Liberace (laughs) was? Apparently, there's a generation now that uh, doesn't know. Oh, I'm sure. At one time, he was the most famous guy on the planet, probably. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so that was really amazing uh, to see a lot of these uh, cards up close and personal. And I guess a lot of them belong to the collection of a guy named Jay Orberg, who's a famous car customizer who also built cards for Hollywood and stuff like that. So a lot of his collection is stored here at this museum, which was neat to see. Wow. So that was right up my alley and, and oh, yeah. really neat. And I got to talking to the, the guy who uh, manages the, the museum and we had a long lengthy com- uh, conversation and we had mutual friends and stuff like that. It was oh, really, great. really pretty awesome. Yeah. And then kind of a weird coincidence on this next slide. Um, when I was in LA, I went to the Ronald Reagan Museum, if you remember, and right. they had the Bonnie and Clyde death car on display. Yep. Well, to my surprise, at this Hollywood car museum, they also had a Bonnie and Clyde car, but this one is from the movie. Okay. The uh, Warren Beatty, Faye Dunaway, right. Bonnie and Clyde oh, movie. Yeah. And so what are the odds, and this was not planned, what are the odds that I would see the original car and the movie car within just a few weeks of each other? Right. Like that that kind of blew my mind. And well, so those, those are real bullet holes in a car. Well, in the, the original the movie, one. The movie car. And no, not in the movie not car. A, okay. What they do in the movie car, and you could, you could sort of tell by some of these holes, is that the holes are blown outward because what they do is they put squibs, little explosives, they line the inside of the car with them. Okay. And then during the scene, the special effects guy triggers these squibs which blow outward, okay. not inward. All right. And so, so they're mimicking the, the, the look of bullets hitting the car when in reality they're planned, precise explosives. Um, so it was really neat to, to see that as well. And um, yeah, there it was, just sitting there to, uh, to pose with. Well, so that was pretty neat. It's just kind of a neat coincidence. Another filming location that I discovered, you know, uh, one of my favorite movies with a Las Vegas theme is Viva Las Vegas with Elvis right. Presley and Anne Margaret. And I found out that there's a wedding chapel, uh, the Little Church of the West, it's called. Um, and it's famous on its own accord, but it was also used in Viva Las Vegas near the very end when, uh, spoiler alert, when Elvis marries um, uh, Anne Margaret at this little church of the West. Right. So I went to go visit it because of that reason, but then as I was kind of researching the church, I found out that some pretty famous couples have been married at this little church in Las Vegas. It has a long history. Yeah. Uh, Judy Garland has been married there. Cindy Crawford married Richard Gere at this church. Angelina Jolie married Billy Bob Thornton at this church. <laughs> Famous couples have been married there. It has an amazing history. My daughter may have been married out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's funny? I sent pictures to a buddy of mine, 
And I said, hey, look where I am. And he replies back and says, I was married there. Okay. <laughs> so my friend was married there. Maybe. Yeah, my daughter so, did get married out there. Yeah. And it might have been the same chapel. I don't That's know. That's awesome. And it's a beautiful little church and very historic and one of the oldest structures still in Vegas. So, oh. so pretty neat to see that. Now, here's probably the highlight of my trip. And again, I just discovered this accidentally, but uh, we are walking through the Luxor, which is a casino shaped like a pyramid on the strip. And I saw a sign that said uh, Titanic exhibit. And I'm like, what's that all about? And I went up and I looked at the signage and stuff and it had been closed to the public at that point. But it's, it said that we, it's an uh, exhibit of artifacts from the Titanic. And so I said, well, I got to come back the next day. So came back the next day, got a ticket, and it absolutely blew my mind. Really? It had, it had things that had been pulled off the bottom of the seafloor wow. in the Atlantic uh, that are now on this touring exhibit. And it, apparently it's been at the well, Luxor it was a for touring, a while. It was a touring exhibit. Yeah, You just yeah. happened to hit it right. Yeah, exactly. Now, wow. I don't know how much longer it's going to be at the Luxor. I, I heard somebody say long term, so okay. it may still be there for a while. Um, but to see dishes and silverware and right. bottles and artifacts uh, that have been pulled off the bottom of the seafloor was pretty amazing. Um, but that wasn't even the highlight. This was the highlight for me. So back in, I don't know if it was the early 90s, mid 90s, as they were exploring the Titanic on the bottom of the ocean, uh, someone spotted a large piece of the Titanic, they call it the big piece, uh, sitting on the seafloor, kind of away from the, the, the wreckage. Right. And they thought, well, <clears throat> how can we get that up? How can we pull that off the seafloor? So their first attempt to pull it up, they got these cables around it and they used this mechanism to get it up. And as it got to the surface of the ocean, a, a freak storm blew in oh, and the cable snapped and the thing sunk back down to the oh, seafloor and stuck in the silt upright so it was like a wall on right. the sea floor yep. well two years go by and they try it again and this time they managed to get it off the sea floor um, I was not expecting to see this at this exhibit and so when I turned the corner and walked into this room this piece is probably 20 feet high by 30 feet wide wow. and you can get right up to it we weren't allowed to touch it um, but I kind of got emotional as I looked really? at this giant piece yeah. of the Titanic right there in Which front of me. Which is a little tiny me. piece of the ship, but yeah. still big. Yeah, and it had, you know, the portholes, and some of the portholes still had brass fittings and even broken glass in it. Oh. And when they pulled it up, it was covered in rust and stuff, so they've, they cleaned it, I, I read, with dental tools and stuff and then coated it in wax to try and keep it from further rusting. Right. But they said with the Titanic sitting on the seafloor getting eaten by bacteria, they said in 20 or 30 years, this mm. might be the last remaining piece of the Titanic for future generations to see. Wow. So it blew my mind that yeah. there it is, the ship that went down in the Atlantic, its last remaining big piece is it in had the to desert be, in it, Vegas. It had to be deep too to yeah, get that exactly. baby out of there. Yeah. They, I guess they used a system where they lowered these diesel-filled bags, which is lighter than water, and they used heavy chains to pull the diesel-filled bags down. They attached the bags, released the chains, which then raised this right. piece to the right. surface. Yeah. So uh, amazing engineering to get that off, off the floor there, but uh, so cool that we can now see that yeah. as it uh, the actual tours ship. around. Wow. Yeah. Pretty amazing. And it uh, ended up in Las Vegas. It's in Las Vegas. Uh, I tried to find out how long it's going to be there. I couldn't find any information. So, like I said, uh, I've been told it's going to be there for a, the long haul. So, yeah. it's going to be there for a while. Well, and there's video that you can find on YouTube of them moving the piece into the Luxor, which is pretty amazing to see as well. well. So, yeah. so, that was the highlight for me. And, uh, and that kind of brings my little tour of Vegas to a close. We were able to do a little photo opportunity. They have a replica of what they call the grand staircase of the Titanic on display there where you can pose for pictures. So my sister and my niece and I posed in, in front of the grand staircase with this little fake newspaper thing. But, wow. um, so th that was something I did not expect to see in Vegas and uh, it was the highlight of my trip. I, I, I got emotional uh, seeing this thing up close. It's a real piece of history. It really I mean, is. Real big, big time history, not just a little bit of history, a little big time history. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Go. So, um, and the, I guess there's been other uh, Titanic touring exhibits. I remember there was one at the Detroit Science Center that I saw years ago. Um, but yeah, it, it was just really remarkable to see this stuff. Now, people argue whether it's ethical to pull this stuff off the sea floor right. because it's technically a grave site, but my personal opinion is if, if it gives us an opportunity to see these in a museum quality setting, sure. I, I'm all for it. You know? Yeah, especially if everybody can go there. Exactly. You know? Yeah, pretty remarkable. So, Well, Joe, thank you so much for doing this tour of Vegas for us. My pleasure. But you hit some spots that, uh, you know, don't normally a lot of people don't, wouldn't even know about. Exactly. Yeah, and you it's know, kind of get, fun to look for the get, things you don't normally associate yeah, with Yeah, you get Vegas. into a situation, you go to Vegas, you end up at a gambling table, and then you lose your money, and you go to bed, <laughs> and you sob the rest of the night yeah. instead of, uh, you know, going to some of these wonderful places you'd visited. Yeah. I have kind of a neat story if we have time. Great. Um, the first time I went to Vegas, I was about 23 years old, and we had some family that lived there, and we went to go pick them up for the holidays. It was a grandmother that lived there. And I was exploring the Strip for the first time ever, and imagine this, as I'm walking the Strip, all the lights go off. The whole Strip goes black. And I look inside one of the casinos, and everyone's gambling, and nobody seems to flinch. No and problem. I'm panicking, like, what just happened? And I, I asked somebody, why did the lights just go off? And they told me that Sammy Davis Jr. had just passed away, oh. and they dimmed the lights on the strip in his honor. No kidding. And I, wow. as a 23-year-old, happened to be standing on the strip when they dimmed the happened? lights in honor of Sammy Davis Jr. Wow. And what are the odds of that? That's so, amazing. Yeah. I got a quick story, too. We had a, a business... If, if everybody made their sales quota for the month, we would, the, our management said that they would take us to Vegas. So we, everybody absolutely had to make their quota. So we all made our quota. We ended up having this meeting in Vegas and we had a bunch of people there. And basically we said, oh, they said um, Bill Cosby was playing at one of the local casinos. So we said, hey, we'd like to go see him. So how much is it? It's 35 bucks. Today would probably be about I don't know, 150 or some <laughs> stupid thing like that. But anyway, we ended up um, saying, well, if, if we take the 35 bucks a piece and we pool the money together, we could go down to the gambling debt, go down to the roulette machine, and we could probably double our money. So we all, everybody decided to do it, except this one girl from <laughs> Minneapolis. And she said, no, she says, I don't want to do it. We finally convinced her to do it. So everybody pooled their money. We had about 20 people. So we had a lot of money. So we went down, we, we said, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna play either black or red, and we're gonna either double our money or we're not gonna go see Bill Cosby. So we had a guy in the group that had a wedge, red sweater on. He said, <laughs> we're gonna go, we're gonna put it on red. First roll, boom, brown, it lands on black. Guy, <laughs> so there goes our $700 or whatever it was. <laughs> On That's one Vegas role. for you. So, and we had then we had a manager from Chicago who's a big gambler. He said, "Well, I'm going to get the money back." So he started <laughs> putting big time money, and he doubled his money every time he bet. Yeah. He put money down on uh, on on red for the next seven rolls, and he lost the money every single time. <laughs> Never got it back. <laughs> So that's my that's my Vegas story. Yeah. Other than the Joe Lewis story. Yeah, yeah. Well, I've never I've never won any <laughs> large amount of money at any casino, so uh, that's not the reason I go. You know, going to Vegas this most recent time was just to have fun and laughs with family and friends. We had a group, maybe fifteen or so people at any given moment, and uh, it was just a good time and, and a much needed break from everything yeah. that's going on yeah. in the world. So. Well, Joel, thank you so much for bringing us up to date on your Vegas trip. My pleasure. And, and is it, it's probably true it. what they say about Vegas. What's, what happens in Vegas <laughs> stays in Vegas, except this time. And not in this case. <laughs> thanks so much for joining us. Well, That's thanks great. for having me. All right.